Good morning and welcome to St John's Online once again. It's been a strange week, hasn't it? This time last week, we were all gearing up for a big week of Winterfest with 64 children set to come running through the front doors and watching the events of Mercy Falls on this set behind me. And that's exactly what happened on Monday. Then on Tuesday, we had to section the groups into two and adjust everything so we didn't have more than the allowed numbers of people in this room. And everyone over 12 was wearing masks. And then came the announcement of lockdown from 6 p.m. This place became a huge flurry of activity as craft bags were packed, drama scenes were recorded, and everyone raced home by 6 p.m. So then the rest of the week, like this morning, was online. It can all feel a bit chaotic and stressful and confusing, can't it? And yet we trust in a good God who knows everything, who is sovereign and is in control. A God who is worthy of us praising with the words as we sing together, Hallelujah. I've been reading this book by Ben Shaw, the man whose testimony at a concert back in 1990 convinced me to find out who Jesus is. If you'd like a copy, there are places to order it from on online or drop me an email. As I've thought about the feeling of chaos from the events of this week, it was comforting this morning to read this section of the book where Ben looks at the description of heaven from Revelation 21, that Peter's actually going to look at again a bit later too. These verses say, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, 
and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, a new Jerusalem, coming down from heaven, from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning nor crying nor pain any more, for the former things have passed away. And Ben went on to say, you might have noticed that John says that there was no longer any sea. For many years, I thought this sounded pretty disappointing until I discovered that the sea represented chaos and instability in the ancient world. It's therefore not saying that in the next life there'll be no bodies of water, but there'll be no longer any turmoil, chaos and disorder. Instead, John sees a city which represents a home, community, safety and security. Most significantly, God is in an uninhibited communion with humanity. John gets a glimpse of how God and people are meant to be, with no tears or pain or suffering anymore. It is in many ways a new Eden. Just think about that for a moment. All those things that make us sad, angry or anxious, gone. No more crime, poverty, greed or family breakups. Disease and death will become things of the past. This whole vision is meant to tell us that life with God is going to be the best time ever. It will be the life to the full that Jesus talked about for all eternity, the very opposite of what many of us have been hearing. Given that life with God will be the best life ever, let's give thanks to him with these words. Gracious God, we humbly thank you for life and health and safety for freedom to work, leisure to rest, and for all that is beautiful in creation and human life. But above all, we praise you for our Saviour, Jesus Christ, for his death and resurrection, for the gift of your spirit, and for the hope of sharing in your glory. Fill our hearts with all joy and peace in believing, through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. First of all, this coming Saturday, we'll have a working bee here at church to restore the church after Winterfest so that we're actually able to meet in here together next Sunday morning. And secondly, there'll be no morning or evening prayer this week and no cafe catch-ups. Uh, it's still school holidays and we won't be running those things during the week ahead. Well, before we hear our Bible reading from Steph, Let's pray that God will prepare our hearts to hear his word. Thank you, Father, for making yourself known to us and showing the way of salvation through faith in your Son. We ask you now to teach and encourage us through your word so that we may be ready to serve you for the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Thanks, Steph. Today's Bible reading comes from Romans chapter 8, verses 18 to 39. For I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed in us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. But the creation was highly sub subjected to futility, not willingly, but because of him who subjected it in hope that the creation itself will be set free from its bondage to corruption and obtain the freedom of the glory of the children of God. For we know that the whole creation has been groaning together in the pains of childbirth until now. And not only the creation, but we ourselves who have the first fruits of the Spirit groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for adoption as sons, the redemption of our bodies. For in this hope we were saved. Now hope that is seen is not hope. For who hopes for what he sees? But if we hope for what we do not see, we wait for it with patience. Likewise, the Spirit helps us in our weakness. 
or we do not know what to pray as we thought, as we ought, but the Spirit himself intercedes for us with groanings too deep for words, and he, he searches hearts who... And he who searches hearts knows what the spirit, what is the mind of the spirit, because the spirit intercedes for the saints according to the will of God. And we know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. For those who are called, for those who are called according to His purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son, in order that he might be the firstborn among many brothers. And those whom he predestined, he also called. And those whom he called, he also justified. And those whom he justified, he also glorified. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not willingly also with him graciously give up all things? Who shall bring any, who shall bring any charge against God's elect? It is God who justifies. Who is to condemn? Christ Jesus is the one who died. More than that, who was raised? who is at the right hand of God, who is indeed interceding for us. Who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or distress or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? As it is written, for your sake we are being killed all the day long. We are regarded as sheep to be slaughtered. No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us. For I am sure that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ our Lord. This is the word of the Lord. Well, welcome to our last in our series on the Creed. I don't know how this past week has been for you, but for me it's been a bit of a disappointing week. We had a plan to gather together in an awesome holiday program with the kind of set that's here behind me, and then we went into lockdown two days into the program. Everything went into crazy recording mode, and you could end up thinking there was something that turned out a little bit meaningless, maybe? Now, I don't think it was. I think we've actually had a a great week. But I want to take up this idea of things that just seem meaningless. You know those motivational posters you can get? Like, usually they have some kind of kitten or something on them with some saying that says, you know, if you believe in yourself, you can become the President of the United States or whatever it happens to be. Um, I hate them so much that one of my favourite things is a site called Despair Inc. Um, It's a wonderful site. I encourage you to go there and look. You can get calendars of demotivational posters. I found this one. I kind of like it. Mistakes. It could be that the purpose of your life is only to serve as a warning to others. Sometimes we can get into that place where we think that life, that the world around us is meaningless. And the irony is that if you pick up a book of the Bible like Ecclesiastes, you find it agreeing with you. In the book of Ecclesiastes, the writer looks at everything facet of life and says, is there meaning in this by itself? Is there any meaning in life under the sun? And he ends up concluding that it is all vanity. It is all meaningless. It is like trying to get the wind to go where you want it to go. The Apostle Paul takes up this idea of being meaningless in 1 Corinthians 15. Have a look at it with me. 
Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise if it's true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile and you're still in your sins. Then those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ we have hope in this life only... We are of all people most to be pitied. See, the idea is that the church in Corinth seemed to be happy with the idea that Jesus came back to life, that Jesus was raised. They just didn't think anybody else was getting raised. They didn't think that the resurrection of the dead was a thing, that they had any hope beyond the grave. And Paul says if there's no hope beyond the grave, then Jesus couldn't have risen. And if Jesus didn't rise, then life is indeed meaningless and certainly the message of Christianity is meaningless. And you see it there, uh, that our preaching is in vain, our preaching is, preaching is meaningless. It's the same word used in the book of Ecclesiastes. And your faith is meaningless. So much hangs not just on the resurrection of Jesus, but on what that means about our resurrection. This morning, as we conclude our series on the creed, we're going to be looking at the reality of the resurrection and what it means for meaning in this world. Maybe you heard uh, Steph read these words. I consider that the sufferings of this present time are not worth comparing with the glory that is to be revealed to us for the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. We're looking in this world that in and of itself seems meaningless, where things can happen that just throw us into a spin that seems pointless. And yet we look at it as people with a hope that gives meaning and shape to everything, indeed, that this whole broken world is yearning for. So as we come to look at this hope of resurrection, let's ask God to be with us as we open his word together. Would you join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we thank you for your word to us. We thank you that it reveals you to us so that we can know you the God who has made himself known by speaking. We thank you that it reveals to us Jesus so that we can know the truth because he is the truth, so that we can know life because he is life, so that we can know the way that we should live because he is the way. And we thank you that your word reveals to us ourselves, exposing us and revealing us so that we can understand ourselves and this world that we live in. So, our God, we ask that as we open your word together, you would help us to see you, that you would help us to see Jesus, that you would help us to see ourselves aright so that we can live in the light of what we learn. For we pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, this morning, I'm not actually going to be unpacking the book of Romans. Uh, if you're in a home group who've been meeting, then you can uh, have a look at the, uh, the study in there. If not, can I encourage you to grab one of those books and you can have a look for yourself. Today, what we're actually going to be doing is we're going to be delving into another book, a book that we're going to be spending next term unpacking in detail uh, as we look at the, the book of Revelation next term. So we're going to be diving in to the end of this book and having a look at what it says about the resurrection of the dead and the life everlasting, because those are the last lines of our creed. Let's start with this idea of life. Life that is bigger and better 
than you might think. Life begins with our creator. This is what uh, the book of Revelation says about God and life. Um, Whenever the living creatures give glory and honour and thanks to him who's seated on the throne, who lives forever and ever, notice that, the 24 elders fall down before him who's seated on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. Again and again in the book of Revelation, God is described as the one who lives the one who has life and a life that is not limited. That's how he is marked out as being special. He is the one who lives forever and ever. And that life is something that he can give. So in chapter 11, we'll look at it next term in detail, but in chapter 11, there are these figures and they die. But after three days, he says, a breath of life from God enters them and they stood up on their feet and great fear fell on those who saw them. I want to focus you on this idea that life now comes as a gift. God breathes life. God who has life God, who is the one who lives forever and ever, now breathes life into these men so that they are living beings. And that's an echo of what happened right back at the beginning. In chapter 2 of Genesis, God breathes life into the first man. So life is something that starts with God and that God gives to us. In chapter 2, verse 7, He who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit says to the churches. To the one who conquers, I will grant to eat of the tree of life, which is in the paradise of God. Back in Genesis chapter 2, the man is set in a garden and is told that he can eat from any of the trees except the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. One of the... There are only two trees that are named in the garden. One is the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The other one's called the tree of life. Because to be in the garden, to be with God, who is life, is to have access to life. If you have access to God, you have access to life. You can feed on the life that comes from him. You can be sustained by his life. That's the picture. The tree of life is to know God, who is the source of life, to be in relationship with him and therefore to have life. So life is something God has, God gives, and to those that are his, he gives it in ongoing abundance, like a tree that continually keeps fruiting. Lest we think that this is something exclusive to the Father, we've been looking at the one God who, who is three persons, Father, Son and Spirit. That's how this creed is arranged. Jesus is also described in similar ways. Um, uh, to the angel in the, of the church at Smyrna write, the words of the first and the last who died and came to life. Jesus is the one who was slain and returned to life. Jesus is the one who can describe himself like the Father as one who has life in himself. He can say, I am the life. And then in chapter 13, all who dwell on earth will worship. It's talking about the, the, uh, the beast, as I say, tune in next term to, for more details. And everyone whose name has not been written before the foundation of the world in the book, of the, la- the book of life of the Lamb who was slain. I just want you to focus on that last bit. That there is this idea that those who belong to Jesus, it, it's like they have their names recorded in a book that says these people have access to life. So what's the picture we're getting here? God is the source of life. And those who are his are given life, life that has something that is bigger than just the sort of thing you get by taking your pulse or that registers on a meter by your bed in a hospital, but is something that is to do with a connection with the living God. Let's spend our time now in the part of Revelation that we're going to focus on. This is chapter 20. In chapter 20, we encounter this picture of what it is for 
people who belong to Jesus. I saw the souls of those who'd been beheaded for the testimony of Jesus and for the word of God and those who had not worshipped the beast or its image and had not received its mark on their foreheads or their hands. That sounds a bit gruesome, but uh, this is about interaction in the Roman world where if you were a Roman citizen and you were found guilty of uh, a, a capital crime, they chopped your head off. Um, that was part of Roman law. So those who had been faithful to Jesus and had paid the price for that, captured in this image of uh, the one who's lost their life for it, but not exclusively, because it includes those who just don't worship the beast. They came to life and reigned with Christ for a thousand years. This is the first resurrection. See, the picture in uh, chapter 20 is Jesus who reigns. He's been reigning since chapter 1. This is not about the millennial reign of Christ. The reign of Christ starts with his resurrection. And it never stops. He's been reigning since chapter 1. The dead in Christ, the ones who are faithful to him, experience, we're told, the first resurrection. They have life. Life in the book of Revelation is something that's exciting and it's something that is only available to those who are connected with Jesus. If you are not connected with Jesus, life is not yours. If you are connected with Jesus, life is inevitably yours. And so you participate in that first resurrection, the return to life. We don't actually get to hear of a second resurrection in the book of Revelation. You hear about the first, there's no mention of a second. There are people who come, uh, the dead who are raised and who stand before God, but it is no, great re it is no real resurrection. Because they don't have life. What they have is death. And who says you can only do it once? Verse 12. I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged by what was written in the books according to what they'd done. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead that were in them, and they were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Then death and Hades were thrown into the lake of fire. This is the second death, the lake of fire. And if anyone's name was not found written in the book of life, he was thrown into the lake of fire. The dead, not the living. That's a term that is reserved for those who belong to Jesus. Life is something that is reserved for those who belong to Jesus. Even though these are people who are being described as, as coming to stand before the throne of God, they're still referred to as the dead. The dead come and stand before God and books are opened. You get the picture, it's, it, this is a law court. And the books, those, those things that contain the evidence, are opened up. I remember somebody saying, we, we, we live in a world that on, constantly talks about its desire for justice. And justice is actually the last thing that any of us wants. Because justice says, I get what I deserve. And if I get what I deserve for what would be written in such a book... Well, the dead is a good name. The books are opened and our actions are laid bare. And yes, we will see times when you know, people can do good and beautiful things. It's just astounding how often in the very next breath we can say something that's devastating and destructive. Maybe that's just me. I can certainly do it. And then we get this picture that the, that the dead are, are given up, handed over for judgment. Even, even those who have died, those who are in the grave, those who have died at sea, and have, all of them 
come to stand before the throne of God. To be judged. Judgment is not something that uh, is limited to those who are hanging around at the time when Jesus returns. The grave that we see as such a final thing in this world is not a final thing in the scriptures. Rather, it is the second death that is more important. Notice, again, we don't hear about the first death. Because the first death isn't a real death. The real death is the second one. The real death is the second one. You get the first resurrection and the second death. And I don't think that's a mistake. You get the first resurrection, we never hear of the second. You get the second death when you don't hear of the first. The first resurrection is for those who belong to Jesus. And for those who return to life in order to be judged, it is no real resurrection for it is just to experience a second death. And notice, what is the big thing that divides one group from another? It is whether their name is written in the Lamb's Book of Life. Because if we are judged according to our actions, every single one of us will be found guilty. If we are judged according to what is in the books, then every single one of us will be found guilty. And it's just. It is entirely just. This picture is of a court that sees everything. And it sees the truth. And it is just. And yet God, in his mercy, rescues from death. So here we get life, something that is bigger and more spectacular and that is found by being in connection with Jesus Christ. And death, something that is much more serious than a heart that stops, something much more serious than what we uh, acknowledge in a funeral service. The second death, the, if you like, the, the real death. The being cut off from God eternally. And the picture is an eternal picture. You notice there, it's, it's, it's the picture of being thrown into the lake of fire. I think the imagery seems to come from the caldera of, a, of an active volcano with all of its um, smell of sulfur and fire. But the picture is also an unending picture. To be against God, to say you want nothing to do with the God who is life, means you get what you ask for and you taste death, real death, eternal death. Death that is less about cessation of heartbeat and brain function and more about an eternity without God. Which brings us to our third word, life, death, eternity. And the fact that it's all about who you spend it with. See, the, the picture in Revelation is less about the fate of those who are against God. That's kind of wrapped up reasonably quickly. The thing that the book of Revelation wants to tell us about is what is ours if we belong to Jesus. And it is magnificent a picture. Chapter 21. I saw the, the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God prepared as a bride, adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore for the former things have passed away. Notice what God says as he announces that he's going to live with us with those who are his. Notice the picture here is not that we all go to heaven. 
The picture is that God comes to us in a new earth and he lives with us. And it goes on, not just in a continuity of years, which I don't know about you, but if I look at this life and I extend it out and think that I'm going to live experiencing life like I do at the moment forever, I, it's not a good option. Because this life is a life full of death and mourning and crying and pain and the idea of that going on and on for millennia after millennia after millennia and experiencing all of it is not a good picture. This isn't just unending. This is not just about quantity. It's about quality. What is promised is a life living with God, because that's the only way you're going to have life, because God is life, and to, to have life means to, to be with God. And when we are with God, then death and mourning and crying and pain aren't with us. I read in a book uh, something that I found rather amusing. It said that one of the greatest inventions of humankind, one of the most astounding, unbelievable inventions that we've ever come up with is boredom. How we can look at a world like ours and get bored takes some pretty spectacular imagination. And the great thing is, that goes with death and mourning and crying and pain. We're going to be with the God who made everything good. We're going to be the, with the God from whom every good and perfect gift comes. And that means when, the God, when this God who we are with wipes every tear from our eyes, when death will be no more, when there will be no more mourning or crying or pain, because the old order has passed away, the eternity we look at is, etern is an eternity that is magnificent. Let's read on. He who was seated on the throne said, Behold, I'm making all things new. Also, he said, write this down, for these words are trustworthy and true. And he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega. That's the first letter of the Greek alphabet, the last letter. We'd say the A and the Z. The beginning and the end. To the thirsty, I will give from the spring of the water of life without payment. To the one who conquers, the one who conquers will have this heritage. And I will be his God and he will be my son. But as for the cowardly, the faithless, the detestable, as for the murderers, the sexually immoral, the sorcerers, idolaters and all liars, their portion will be in the lake of fire that burns with fire and sulfur, which is the second death. A couple of things. The making things new. To the thirsty I will give from the spring of the water of life. This has got such rich meaning to it. In, in, in Genesis chapter 2, when the garden, the beautiful place of uh, the new creation, where God dwelt with, with Adam and Eve, when it's described, the beginning of its description is of a river. A river that flowed and brought life everywhere. And throughout the scriptures, this image of the, the, the source of life, the water that is at the source of life, that comes from knowing God and being with God, is again and again picked up. So you can find it at the end of Zechariah. You can find it in the book of Isaiah as God puts out this appeal in chapter 55 to come to the waters, to come and buy without money the water that gives you life. So how is this eternity described? It's being described as having access to that water, that water that is life itself, that sustains and nurtures. Not like our world is at the moment in its brokenness and its disease and its uh, frustration and its lockdowns and its... Um, it's not like that. It is a world connected with the very source of life.
and it's part of this making things new. There's, a, there's the, the beauty of the relationship. Notice the one who conquers will have this heritage. I will be his God. He will be my, my son. Where does that come from? It comes from the promise God made to his people. It's the great covenant promise. I will be your God and you will be my people. And incredibly, the family language, not of the people of God, but of the king, the son, the one who gets the title son of God, the the. the, the, the the messianic king, the thing that deserves, that is rightly held by Jesus, gets extended to us. So this picture of God making all things new, of taking us up in his plan for eternity, is a magnificent picture. But we haven't finished, have we? There were those last verses. Perhaps they make you uncomfortable as you read them. I hope so. They're supposed to. What's particularly disturbing about these is it's a little list that's intended to describe everything. Everything that is broken about human nature. Everything that would be in those books. And as I read that list... It is only because of the grace of God to me in Jesus Christ that they don't describe my fate. If nothing else, surely the all liars tag snags us. And the inheritance for those who stand on their own deeds. The inheritance for those who want to stand before God and say, I did it my way, is not a pleasant one. The inheritance, whilst eternal, is eternal exclusion, eternal rejection. church in Sydney, a church called St Barnabas Broadway. On the 14th of November, 1932, there was a preacher who was preaching at St Barnabas Broadway, a guy named John Riley, uh, John Ridley, rather. And his big appeal in his sermon was these words. Eternity, eternity. I wish I could sound or shout that word to everyone in the streets of Sydney. You've got to meet it. Where will you spend eternity? It's really the question that is at the nub of what we're looking at today. There was one man who was there and who heard that message. And he went out from there thinking, I know what I can do. Um, He was a returned serviceman. But he was pretty well illiterate. He had trouble writing his own name. But there was one word that he could write, and he wrote it beautifully, and he wrote it everywhere, in yellow chalk, everywhere he could. And that word was eternity. And for 20-something years, nobody knew who it was that was going around the streets of Sydney with yellow chalk writing in beautiful copper plate the word eternity. Because he heard that appeal, I wish that I could sound or shout that word to everyone in the streets of Sydney and thought, well, I can do this much. So he just became known as Mr. Eternity because nobody knew who he was. Then in the 1950s, One reporter found him and snapped four photos, at which point he realised that he had no film left in his camera, asked Mr Eternity to wait, raced off to get some more film, and by the time he got back, he was gone. The man's name was Arthur Stace. 
I think one of the most beautiful things that we've seen in our country was that when we celebrated the new millennium with fireworks in Sydney, they lit up the Harbour Bridge and in his copper plate wrote on it, Eternity. If you want to read more, you can actually get the book, Mr Eternity, the story of Arthur Stace, um, Acorn Press, barcode number, not, no, I won't tell you that. It's a really interesting story of a guy who couldn't do a lot but could do this one thing and did it so incredibly that there is an eternity presentation in Canberra, there is an eternity theatre in Sydney, there are, the, there, there are laws which are known as Arthur's Laws, which means that chalk drawing on pavement is, not, is excluded from um, defacing public property laws. His name has gone everywhere out of this desire for people to hear this incredible truth, eternity. I wish that I could shout that word to everyone in the streets of Sydney. I wish I could shout that word to everyone in the streets of Brisbane. You're going to meet it. Where will you spend eternity? Friends, it's right that this is the conclusion of our series on the creed. As you see, it takes us right through to the end of the end of the end and keeps going after that. Eternity is where it takes us. The reality that there is a resurrection for those who belong to Jesus, whose names are written in his book. There is an eternity for those who wish to do it their way, who want to stand on their own actions and on the basis of those actions, faces an eternity excluded from the God they've ignored. There is a beautiful picture that invites us to respond. So when we say at the end of the creed, I believe in the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting, we're saying, I believe in a Jesus whose rescue of me has given me a place in that life, in eternity, in the new world the, the newness that God is making. And we're saying, I believe in the reality that for those who reject him, that eternity is not a good one. We're saying we believe in the choice. So when we get to the end of the creed, when we rattle it off week after week, I believe in God the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body and the life everlasting. When we get to the end, we're given a choice. We can't just rattle it off. It comes with a choice. In saying, I believe in that God, we're saying, I am choosing to follow Jesus, to participate in that reality. Because to say that all those things are true and yet not follow Jesus is to acknowledge the reality of an, 
eternity that is dark and to choose it over life. And I just can't see the point of that. Friends, eternity. Where will you spend it? Let's finish by saying our creed. By saying it with conviction, with joy, with boldness. And as we get to the end, say it with me as a choice to follow that Jesus and enjoy the eternity of life in God's new world. Let's stand and say together. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, God's only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died and was buried. He descended to the dead. On the third day, he rose from the dead. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. From there, he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen.
we're going to move into a time of prayer, starting with prayers of confession to this great God that we've been hearing about in this morning's sermon, who forgives us for all our sins. Return to the Lord your God, who is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love, says the prophet Joel. And in Hebrews we read, let us approach the throne of grace with confidence so that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in our time of need. Let us now confess our sins together to Almighty God. Heavenly Father, you have loved us with an everlasting love, but we have broken your holy laws and have left undone what we ought to have done. We are sorry for our sins and turn away from them. For the sake of your Son who died for us, forgive us, cleanse us, and change us. By your Holy Spirit, enable us to live for you through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, hear these words of assurance from Romans 6. Christ died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. In the same way, count yourselves dead to sin, but alive to God in Christ Jesus. And from Ephesians chapter 2, God, who is rich in mercy, out of his great love with which he loved us, even when we were dead through our trespasses, made us alive together with Christ. By grace you have been saved. Let's continue in prayers with Anne now. Thanks, Anne. Would you join with me in prayer? Our loving Heavenly Father, it is with great joy that we, your people, come to you in prayer today. We've just experienced the sweet fellowship of Winterfest. We've known the joy of working together to tell children and their families that Jesus loves them, to assure them that he died to rescue them, each one individually. We rejoice that your word has gone out and we pray earnestly to you that it will bear much fruit. By your grace, may it bear even more fruit because of having to be online with the children listening to the remainder of the message in their own homes. Thank you, Lord, for working all things out for good of your kingdom, even a COVID lockdown. We pray that they and their families may come to know Jesus as their saviour. Father, hear our prayer through Jesus Christ, our Lord. We also rejoice to be reminded today that we should never allow the sufferings and struggles of this world to blind us for the amazing glory that will be revealed in us and for us. Fill our minds with the wonder of partaking in this privileged relationship that we, as your children, have with the God of all creation. But Father, when we're overwhelmed by our fleeting momentary troubles, remind us of the ready help you have available to us through your Holy Spirit. Even our prayers today need that help. We struggle to express ideas and concepts that are far above anything that this world has to offer and we're in danger of taking your gracious gifts for granted. Father, teach us how to fully understand and fully appreciate the treasure you have given us. We thank you with grateful hearts for the amazing support we receive through the mysterious and wonderful work of your Holy Spirit. Lord, it's not hard for us to see the groaning of the whole of creation. Just this week, the horrendous heat and wildfires in Canada, the anguish and overwhelming needs of the displaced people of Tigray, the ravages of the pandemic across the whole world, the heartaches of those who struggle with family violence and the hideous outworkings of drug abuse. These have all been part of our daily news programs. We groan in response as we try to expand our prayers to encompass the needs of such a terribly needy 
world. Nothing short of the return of Jesus and the restoration he promised can remedy such dire needs. We long for the day when what we taught the kids at Winterfest is realised, that Jesus is known by all people everywhere as wonderful counsellor, mighty God, everlasting Father, the Prince of Peace. Father, we pray, hasten the coming of that day. We ask this through Jesus Christ, our Lord. And meanwhile, Lord, we pray for the world's leaders. Especially we ask that they will forsake national aggrandizement and seek to care for the poor and needy and marginalised. Stir up a desire to see that all people everywhere have access to the vaccine at a price that is affordable to even the least of them. Watch over our friends in South Africa and keep them safe as the pandemic rages there once again. We also ask you to watch over those in our congregation who are in need or sickness or are suffering through events that are not known to us. Strengthen their trust in your goodness and in your willingness to respond to your children's needs. Embolden them to ask for help as we, their friends, do so on their behalf today. Pour out your love and strengthen each one known to us. And I pause now for you to pray for those who are on your heart today. And so, Lord, we bring our prayers together, thanking you for the past week, thanking you for your great goodness and for the fact that nothing can separate us from the love of God in Jesus Christ, our Lord. Would you pray with me the Lord's Prayer? Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Save us from the time of trial and deliver us from evil. For the kingdom, the power and the glory are yours now and forever. Amen. Well, let us conclude our time in prayer. Loving God, we thank you for hearing our prayers, feeding us with your word and encouraging us in our meeting together. We say together, take us and use us to love and serve you and all people in the power of your spirit and in the name of your son, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Well, what better way to finish our series on the Apostles' Creed than by singing this version of the Apostles' Creed that has been prepared for us. This I believe. Yeah.
Well, let me leave you with these words from today's Bible reading from Romans chapter 8, verses 38 and 39. For I am sure that neither death nor life, nor angels, nor rulers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor powers, nor height, nor depth, nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of God in Christ Jesus our Lord. Aren't they wonderful, wonderful words? Thank you for joining us online. Please now head over to Zoom and join us for morning tea. The details will come up in the chat. So I'll see you there soon.